Okay, welcome back. Let's see if we can do a quick recap of our session eight, I believe is what we're up to. And so last session, the guys decided that they were moving from Lochvarn to the Derg Valley. Um, so they, you know, they took the road, visited St. Nileen's and then departed, headed toward the pass uh, and ultimately to um, the Derg Valley. Uh, now, as it happens, once they started climbing up into the pass, uh, the temperature dropped significantly and they had uh, a snow uh, storm. Uh, you know, it's late. It's, uh, uh, it's the late fall, right? Uh, the, the snow was coming much earlier than expected, but also given the elevation of the pass, uh, you know, it's more likely to snow. So this unforeseen circumstances uh, delay their passage through the pass uh, and cause them uh, to reach about this point here by nightfall, right? And they should have, you know, they had expected to be along the road in the valley per se by this time, but this unexpected snowstorm uh, delayed them. From their position up there, they managed to catch a glimpse of a campfire hidden behind uh, in the valley in this area which both Cormac and Lochlan have visited before recognized as the tumulus of, uh, of Derg. This is a large uh, burial mound where uh, the veterans of uh, the War of Invasion when the Alaran conquerors uh, conquered this portion of Calicia uh, fought in ages past uh, they came over the, the mountain passes and, you know, split into two armies, one headed west along this road towards Skells, and the other one, you know, headed east uh, to the pass. And, you know, gr there was a lot of fighting because this was the main avenue of invasion of the Alaran peoples. Uh, so once, you know, the Calisians basically surrendered, um, the, the, they buried their dead in this mass grave, large cairn type of, you know, barrow um, with standing stones uh, next to it, right, to commemorate the site. And uh, the place was sealed with a large stone blocking the entrance. Uh, and that is the tumulus, right? It's an area which is normally off limits to people. Only usually the Morthans come here and only in rare occasions. Um, so a campfire this high up is very unexpected. Um, both Lochlan, no, both Arthmael and uh, Cormac have some experience in wilderness. So they realize that whoever built this campfire is trying to hide it. And it really wouldn't be visible from the road or from the village of Derg over here. It's really only because they're high up in the past that they can get a glimpse of this. So, you know, they decide, they weigh their chances and they decide to investigate. So Cormac goes off, you know, the, the, the crew, the entire crew just basically descends towards the, the, the crossing here, the little crossroads, and then Cormac just stealthily makes his way up to investigate this campfire. He succeeds admirably at a skill check and discovers three, uh, you know, Calician peasants drinking, le le leaning against a large barrel of wine. Uh, they, they have a campfire going. They have weapons by their sides, mostly clubs, knives, and quivers of arrows and bows. And the arrows have the black fletching of the uh, uh, Black Feathers, which is the bandit gang that has been plaguing this uh, region. Um, you know, Cormac realizes that when last they saw tracks of these bandits coming over the pass, one of the wagons had broken and, uh, cause they had stolen merchandise from some merchants and killed them and left them for that for dead. And, but one of the wagons broke and then there was this shape dragging along uh, the road and so, you know, between the conversation of the, of the, of the bandits and uh, what Cormac remembers, he realizes that what they were dragging was this barrel of wine. 
and it seems the bandit hid it here uh, and kept it concealed from the rest of the bandits. Um, uh, with their drunken conversation, they also learn a bunch of things. First, that uh, the bandits left the wine here because they couldn't push it across the river, right? It was too heavy, so they decided to hide it and tell everybody else that the, the, the barrel had broken and the wine spilled out. And what they did is just hid this good wine here, and every so often they cross uh, the river and come and drink. And it's it's been about almost two weeks since they killed those merchants, but it's a huge barrel, so it's difficult to put a dent in it, right? Um, you know, one of the bandits says, he lets out that their local leader, uh, Hager, has um, gone uh, west to confer with uh, Rajan, the leader of the rest of the bandits. Um, and so they, these three took the chance and sneaked down to have a drink. Uh, they also discuss, you know, what to do about the barrel, because they're probably going to have to move soon. And uh, one of them mentions just pushing open the half-opened uh, stone door to the cairns, to the large tumulus, right? Um, it was supposed to have been sealed by DeMorthan before, uh, but he mentions that it's partly open, that perhaps they could open the barrow fully and push the, the barrel inside and, and hide it, right, from view. Uh, so they're discussing this, and Cormac decides to go back and fetch the other two uh, to help him uh, apprehend the bandits, right? Because one of his beliefs is he has to deal with the danger to the people, right? So uh, Lachlan the Bard decides, you know, he... he concocts this plan where he's going to try to scare the bandits and distract them while the other two rush them and take away, away their weapons. So, you know, once everybody moves into position, Lachlan steps into the into the light and, you know, hoping to, to put himself in a position where the campfire uh, light just casts a large shadow and, and see if he can, you know, scare them that way you know, by stepping between the campfire and the bandits and, you know, basically passing himself off as a spirit, right, from the barrow. And he, you know, he does a booming voice and tries to to intimidate them. And uh, he actually doesn't succeed at the check. So the bandits just, instead of reacting by freezing, they react by diving for the weapons, right? Um, and then combat ensues. Uh, during the combat... Um, Lochling just steps forward and uh, manages to step on the bandit's weapon and just threatens him with a knife. And the bandit just pulls back and doesn't do anything uh, immediately. Uh, actually, he turns around and starts to run. Uh, no, that's actually at the end of the, of the round, right? He, immediately, he just stops. Um... Arthmael tries to hit one of the bandits on the head and manages to score a, a hit, but the, uh, the the bandit is wearing his leather helm and it manages to deflect the blow enough that it doesn't really inflict a, a full wound. It only does a minor wound. Um, and on the other side, Cormac rushes the third bandit and... Since the bandit doesn't have his weapons and he is a knight, he decides to shield bash uh, this third bandit and succeeds in, in, in causing a major hit, major wound. And so the bandit, you know, staggers back, face bleeding and having been body slammed with a shield. Uh, the edge of the shield caught him on the, on the face and hence the blood, right? So he's badly injured. Um... The bandits react differently. Uh, the one uh, attacking Arthmael just manages to grab a club and swing blindly at Arthmael, but he's a bit drunk and completely misses Arthmael with a swing. Um, uh, Arthmael proceeds to just smack him down. Uh, no, grab him. As, as the swing goes wide, Arthmael grabs him and throws him to the ground. And uh, that, that bandit suffers some damage as he hits the ground hard and basically, you know, surrenders at that point. Uh, the bandit that Cormac 
managed to strike with the shield bash, steps back, draws a knife from his belt, realizes that he's facing a fully armored uh, knight, and then just flips the dagger at uh, Cormac, who manages to, to, you know, partially bat it off, although the, the knife just manages to nick him uh, and takes a minor wound, uh, but nothing major, right? And then that bandit turns around and starts to run, but at that point... Uh, Cormac just slices down with a sword and cuts up in his calf and the bandit collapses to the ground screaming in pain as he's bleeding from a cut. Um, the bandit that Lachlan is holding, is holding at, at, at knife point uh, just reacts by turning around and starting to run. Uh, Lachlan's instinct is to jump and try to grab the guy uh, but he misses, so he lands on, on his face, and uh, the bandit just starts to run up the hill of the tumulus. Uh, Lachlan gets up and tries to pursue, but since he was lying in the ground, you know, I just, we did a, an opposed dexterity check, and Lachlan checked with disadvantage because he had to get up first, and the other guy has a lead start. So what winds up happening is that Lachlan reaches the, the, the top of the tumulus and sees the guy, but then Lachlan loses his footing in the darkness, right? He's half blinded by the light of the campfire, and he has no torch or anything, so he just tumbles down the side of the hill and loses track of, loses track of the bandit who gets away. Um, coming back uh, to the camp, he finds the other uh, two people just holding the bandits at bay and by this time Cormac has uh, bandaged the wounded by, uh, bandit's uh, leg and restrained him. And so, uh, you know, based on what they heard, uh, Arthmael, the Demorthan, and uh, Cormac decide to investigate this open uh, entrance to the barrow. So when they when they hit, when they you know, they, they grab some torches, they go over there, they realize that the large stone door seems to have moved and the threshold entrance to the barrow is cracked. So, you know, they deduce that there has been some sort of earthquake, which has caused the land to shift, and the stone, which was once securely held in position, is now ajar and, and has enough of a gap to where a human... A man can can sneak, you know, sort of squeeze through the opening and make it inside. Uh, but it's not, like, easy to go in or out. Uh, they thrust a, a torch through the opening and, you know, see a bunch of cobwebs, but it th th doesn't seem to have been recently disturbed. Um, Arthmael recognizes, you know, like the layout. He He's a Demorthan, so if this were, if he were you know, directing the building of a communal grave such as this, he, he sort, of ha sort of has an instinctive understanding for what the layout of the place would be. But, you know, having satisfied himself that it doesn't appear to be disturbed, uh, they decide to attempt to close the stone door, and unfortunately they do not succeed at a strength check, so, you know, they realize that the stone is too heavy, and if they want to move it, they really need a crew of people to come in and help, so they decide to go about and, uh, you know, place some stones uh, which are lying freely about this region. You know, we figure if they have enough stone to carve those standing stones, there's, there's you know, rocks and such lying about that they can move and use to block the entrance. So, you know, they, they go about that. And meanwhile, uh, Lachlan is back there intimidating the capture bandits. You know, the one who's in pain is not much use for anything, but the other one, uh, Lachlan says, you know, maybe I know this guy from somewhere, so he rolls, and it he rolls very high, and it turns out that he recognizes this person. Um, he is uh, the son of an influential family in Derg, but this uh, guy is, is, you know, he's pretty lazy, and he likes the drink a little bit too much, and so, you know, he's a bit of a rebel against his father, and it's just a farming, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's the son of a prominent family, but they're just farmers. Like, what expects him uh, in his life is just doing farmer's work, and it's really hard, so this guy is not really into it. 
So they get into this conversation where Lachlan attempts to convince uh, this man by the name of... Uh, hang on, I always forget the name. Of Alfred to, you know, tell him about what's going on, who are these bandits, what's going down. And the bandit, of course, doesn't want to tell him unless he can get assurances from Lachlan that, you know, he will talk to the Demorthan and talk to the knight that they're not going to hang him for this because he's cooperating, right? So he basically wants a, 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 a plea agreement, right? Um, and they, you know, they go back and forth. Uh, Lachlan menaces, you know, says, hey, they, they catch you either at the village or at the fortress where Lord Argan is. They're going to hang you for banditry. So you might as well just say whatever you have. And the bandit says, yeah, I'll tell you anything you want to know, but you got to promise that you put in a good word for me because you're the bard and you are influential with both the Demorthan and you might have some influence also with the with a knight, right? Because the knights don't really want to mess too much with the, the Morthans and the bards and upset the Calisians for no reason, right? So he might be able... He, he does have some influence and might be able to put it to, to good use. So we roll the post-manipulation checks and lo and behold, uh, um, Lachlan rolls with advantage. He rolls a 1 and a 2 on his d20, so he fails and the... Uh, Bandit actually succeeds and beats him at it, so Lachlan ag agrees to plead, his to plead his case, right? So he is given the information, right? The other, you know, the wounded guy with a leg is named Barian, and the bandit who ran off is named Finian. They're headed off across a ford, which not too many people know about. It is just north of their current position, right? So uh, Finian ran up north and he's going to cross uh the river this ford is not accessible throughout the year it, it's only accessible in fall and winter uh but in spring with the melting of the snows the river grows and the ford is unusable and it's not really very reliable in summer either depending on, on if it rains too much so it's a risky you know, crossing point, but these guys use it during the winter, right? Near late autumn, early winter. So, uh, you know, they've learned that this bandy ha has gone on to Aldrich's farm right here. And uh, th they basically, again, confirmed that this man, Hager, controls the bandits. Uh, they're all part of the Black Feathers gang, but the Black Feathers gang is about 30 strong. And it's divided in two contingents, right, east and west, based on the on the on the bridge, right. So one half of the bandit gang takes the road that goes this way; the other half just takes this road, right. They both have commerce, but nobody takes the northern road because that's the one where the too close to the knights, right. You don't want to go there. So that's what he learns, that the man named uh, Hager controls uh, this side of the river and the man known as Ragin controls the western side. Um, he learns that uh, Hager has gone west to confer with Ragin, so they don't know when he'll be back. Uh, but, you know, by this time, uh, uh, Finian is, is making his way there. So if the bandits come back, they'll be alerted. Um, so the guys decide, you know, by this time Cormac and Arthmel come back and, you know, um, Lachlan gives them an outline of, you know, what he's learned and they decide that their best course of action is to put the wounded man on on the donkey, on Arthmel's donkey named Thad and uh, just head to Derg to sleep. Uh, there is a brief conversation where uh, Cormac, you know, where Lachlan says, you know, this guy, is a, we have a deal, we're not going to hang him, we're just, he's cooperating, right? And Cormac puts up some resistance, right? You know, he's got to hang, you can't defend him, he's a bandit and he murders other innocent people, so he deserves to hang for this. So they sort of start that conversation, but, you know, uh, nothing major is, uh, no major confrontation goes on there. So, you know, we decided to end it with uh, 
the guys just making their way up to Derg proper, and it's late at night, but they are received by, you know, uh, there's probably whoever lies next to the, to the, to the city, to the village walls, right? Uh, there, there's, there must be some sort of gatekeeper. He, they awaken him, and he opens the gate and leads them to the great hall for the Ansa Ilir. Uh, but we said, we'll just leave it here, and we'll, you know, we'll start next session with entering uh, Derg and having some discussions. I asked them, you know, what are the future plans? Uh, you know, broad strokes, unless more information is gathered at Derg. And they sort of came to the conclusion amongst themselves that tackling the bandits at this time is too difficult because there's way too many bandits and they can't risk having that many bandits show up. Uh, they might get killed, so they decide that the best course of action is to head north uh, at the start of next session, uh, cross the bridge and head up uh, north to Feriel and to Fortress Muriel. In Fortress Muriel, they can report the situation to Lord Argon, see if he can send a contingent of warriors to take care of that uh, nest of bandits, and, you know, they can go to Feriel and perform the wedding, which is one of the things that uh, Arthmael learned uh, at the very first session when we started the game, that there is a young couple, the son of a local renowned blacksmith and the daughter of the Ansilier, uh, want to get married, and they're waiting for a Demorthan to come their way, and this is part of the Demorthan's duties. So they figured if we go north to the Feriel and Fortress Muriel region, we can basically kill two birds with one stone, right? Uh, so those are the broad stroke uh, plans for next session, and hopefully we'll find out what happens next week. And that's a short recap, guys. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.